right, everyone. I am here with Tim Rocktushel. Tim is a research scientist at Facebook AI Research and associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at University College London. Tim, welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. I am really looking forward to digging into our conversation. We'll be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is reinforcement learning. Uh, but before we do, I would love to have you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in the field. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I um, started a PhD actually in natural language processing at University of College London in 2013. Um, I got interested in generally knowledge representations, knowledge graphs, and how we can reason, uh, you know, about knowledge and for new facts from these knowledge graphs. Um, I also did some work on um, textual entailment and uh, other NLP problems, but I got more and more excited about um, reinforcement learning. I felt um, in NLP, lots of the data sets back then, they were static and it was mostly, you know, chasing uh, scores uh, on leaderboards. And I was very intrigued, I guess, by work that came out of, uh, you know, top AI labs like DeepMind and OpenAI at the time. Um, so I, you know, went over to Oxford, did a postdoc with uh, uh, Shimon Whiteson's reinforcement learning group there. And then after the postdoc, um, I joined UCL as a lecturer back then and also Facebook at Research in London. Awesome, awesome. And when you think about your kind of research uh, agenda at the university and the work that you focus on at Facebook, how do you characterize it? What are the bounds of your interests? So the thing that we care most about at this point are being able to train agents that can somewhat generalize to novel situations. So we strongly believe that um, over the last decade, uh, quite a bit of the research in the field has unfortunately focused on very limited environments. So, uh, you know, games like Atari games come to mind. This has been obviously um, really fantastic for advancing the field, but it can only go so far in that, you know, Atari games are deterministic. Um, there's only so much kind of novel situations that you encounter in these kind of games. And we are really far away from being able to apply these reinforcement learning uh, techniques to uh, lots of the real world problems that we would care about. So really my work focuses on how we can move closer towards these kind of real world problems. How can we drop some of these kind of simplified assumptions that are baked into some of the uh, you know, environment simulators that we've been used for driving uh, reinforcement learning research. And um, from there, basically it's a slippery slope into um, procedurally generated games and uh, you know, training agents that are intrinsically motivated and curious, even uh, training agents that can design their own kind of problems in these simulated worlds to then hopefully get agents that can generalize better to um, new tasks and new situations. Yeah, and when you talk about kind of these constrained environments versus unconstrained environments, is a unconstrained environment something like, you know, what we might be familiar with, with OpenAI Gym or Mujoku or something like that, where you have these figures or humanoids or do you think about that differently? So it's a bit different. So OpenAI Gym is a really fantastic interface that allowed uh, us researchers, right, to basically speak the same language in terms of how to interact with environments. Um, but it's really just an interface, right? And then there are lots of different uh, and actual environments that connect to that interface. For example, Atari uh, games are, uh, you know, connected to this OpenAI Gym interface. So if you, as a researcher, want to create a model um, or new, you know, RL agent that should, you know, do something sensible in these environments. You can just follow that interface, and other researchers kind of can, you know, write other models, and they're all kind of compatible in terms of interacting with that environment. Uh, same goes with Mujoku. Um, so, so the problem with things like Mujoku or, um, you know, other environments that we've been using for a long time is that they are somewhat limited, right? Each of these environments make or have baked in certain simplifying assumptions that unfortunately mean that when a you know, cohort of researchers over a long time do research on it, eventually they find uh, uh, ways to basically um, exploit these simplifying uh, assumptions. Now, I'm not saying that you know, we can directly jump into completely unconstrained environments. The only such environment that comes to my mind is the real world, right? We would have to directly <laughs> make a jump towards training you know, real robots in the real world. And that's um, for many reasons, I think, very uh, challenging, right? It's it's slow because you can't, you know, speed up time. Uh, you have all kinds of engineering challenges with robots falling apart and whatnot. So mm -hmm. I'm saying we still find to use simulated environments that are somewhat constrained, but we need to be very 
um, explicit about the simplifying assumptions that are built into these environments. And we need to gradually remove them to be able to then develop methods that are somewhat of a general nature so that we have the hope at some point to learn something generally about training agents that can do things for real-world tasks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we've talked a lot about in the context of, for example, computer vision, how uh, deep learning models are so good at picking up patterns. Uh, they you know, will pick up uh, a pattern that is you know, correlated with the, the result that you want, the label that you want, but not really the one that you want them to pick up. Um, an example that comes to mind from a recent conversation was uh, the, you know, a pen mark that happened to be used um, on a radiology image to, you know, that's correlated with whether there's cancer in the, the actual specimen. You said something that kind of suggested that, you know, in the RL setting, the models will, you know, pick up on these kind of tangential um, constraints of the environment and that um, impacts the way that they, uh, the way that they're trained, et cetera. Is that, is the, you know, are there similar effects in, in that way or? It's actually worse. Um, it's, um, you know, that problem we also have, right? So the moment you use deep function approximators like deep neural networks um, that get any input as data, they might, as you said, uh, they might just latch on to certain spurious correlations in the data. That is true for natural language processing, computer vision. It's also true for reinforcement learning uh, uh, environments, right? If you happen to have, um, for example, a certain, you know, visually rich reinforcement learning environment where the agent is supposed to do a certain task, maybe there's a certain cue in the training uh, episodes that allows the agent to, you know, do well there. But then once you change something slightly, you change the background, you change some of the textures in that in that environment, the agent will most likely break down and not do anything sensible. So that's, that's, that problem is there too. What I'm talking about is, uh, I think, a, somewhat a, a worse problem in that um, we as researchers, right, we oftentimes um, design in RL, we design our own kind of environments to do the research, right? We um, create, um, you know, our, in, our own kind of games or we use um, games like the, the Atari games. And that works for some time, but if you are then not careful, right? You as a researcher over years and years as a, as a research cohort, right? You start to actually exploit that simulator. You say, okay, now we have an agent that can, you know, solve some of the hardest exploration problems in Atari, but then really what does that tell us for the real world, right? What does it tell us for real world problems when let's say all your agent is doing is kind of memorizing over time, what are the right steps to do? If you change anything in that game, you know, this agent would be screwed, right? So how do you, how do you learn something general about uh, AI agents that you want to deploy at some point to solve, you know, actual real world problems? That's the that's the challenge. Yeah. Got it. So go, going back to the comparison with computer vision, it's kind of the overfitting on ImageNet problem. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and so, how do you propose to address this problem? What are what are some of the things that you've done in this area? So. I mean, to be honest, I think one can step back a bit and say, actually, there were multiple researchers that recognized that problem um, some some time ago. So a few years ago, people started to use what's called um, procedurally generated environments for training and testing RL agents. And what that means is that you actually have a generative process that, given the start of an episode, can generate a new, whole new world, basically, right? A whole new kind of problem, right? A new maze or a new new game with new dynamics or... Yeah, if you think about, for example, Minecraft, right? Really, a, a new kind of landscape where whatever you, I mean, whatever you learned before in terms of the topology of the world you find yourself in, it's going to be different now, right? Certain things stay the same. The environment dynamics stay the same, right? So the way how certain items work and and what certain uh, you know enemies do to you, right? That stays the same. But at least in terms of the um, the kind of visual inputs and the topology of the map, right? Things change uh, dramatically. And um, there were multiple researchers who've been taking that approach, right? Starting to create um, procedurally generated environments to test the generalization capabilities of RL agents. Um, some prominent examples are actually indeed Minecraft. So that has been used for reinforcement learning research, although it's a, somewhat a slow simulator. Um, there was the obstacle tower challenge um, where you have a basically 3D jump and run pro um, environment, again, where every episode uh, blocks that you have to jump over and doors and keys that you have to, um, you know, interact with the position of these change. 
Um, so that was uh, quite exciting. And then um, more recently, OpenAI released this uh, um, ProcGen benchmark. So these are 16 uh, games that look a bit like Atari games, but that are actually procedurally generated. That means in every episode, for example, again, the maze uh, structure changes or the textures even of um, the game assets change. So your agents really have to systematically generalize um, with respect to certain factors of variation. And, um, and that is interesting, right? Because now we are talking about a regime that's closer to actually what people do in computer vision and natural language processing, where they have a training set and then they have a held out test set and they actually test for generalization, right? They can see how much actually overfitting is happening. So now we can do that. And yeah, that's, that's what, what other people did in the space back then. And we looked at that and, and honestly, we were really, you know, um, really excited about this. It's to me, research is really not a zero sum game. It's great to see what, what other people are doing, but one of the gaps that we identified um, back then, and this is roughly two, three years ago, is that these environments, these procedurally generated environments, they are either quite rich, like Minecraft, right? There, where there's really lots of things to do, lots of um, you know uh, entities to interact with, but they're really slow to simulate. So that's not great news for like contemporary uh, reinforcement learning approaches. So you can't really do like good research with it unless you have really tremendous computational resources, and even then, it's it's problematic. Or these are um, procedurally generated environments, but they are actually relatively limited in terms of the uh, richness, right? In terms of interacting with different entities and uh, agents having to acquire certain skills. They're actually more like, okay, I have to move around, maybe get a key, open a door, but then that's mostly it. Whereas what we would want ideally is something that is really rich and complex, but at the same time, very fast to simulate so that we can still make progress with like current state of the art reinforcement learning methods. So that's the kind of gap that we identified two or three years ago. And then basically that lead, led to um, looking into a very interesting class of games um, called Rook-likes. Um, so these are um, dungeon crawl games um, uh, and um, they have a very long tradition. Um, so Rook, I think itself was implemented in the, in, in the early 80s. And then there's another much richer game called NetHack uh, which we then settled on in terms of uh, turning it into a reinforcement learning environment. Um, NetHack is, uh, I think, was developed in 1987. It's played entirely in a terminal, so every thing that you observe is actually ASCII characters in a in a terminal, and that makes it really, really fast to simulate. But it's extremely rich and complex at the same time, uh, as well. It's it has hundreds of um, items, hundreds of monsters that all behave differently, so you have to learn over time how to uh, you know avoid them or fight them. Um, it's, uh, as I mentioned, procedurally generated. So every time you play it, it's different. Um, the moment you die, the game is over. You have to start from the very beginning of the game. And again, it's procedurally generated. So you can't really memorize anything about like certain, uh, you know, landmarks or, or you know, um, positions in, in the previous game. Um, and it's very long as well. It takes an average player something like 50,000 steps um, to complete the game. That's very different to some of the grand challenges that have been uh, used in the past for AI. If you think about StarCraft II, for example, that game takes uh, something like 15 minutes and depending on how many actions you allow the agent to do per second, it means something like 2,000 steps for an episode, whereas here we're talking about, as I mentioned, 50,000. Um, NetHack is open source, so then you know we decided to say, look, we're going to turn that into an RL benchmark and we're going to see how well you know vanilla deep reinforcement learning uh, approaches do. And that's Yeah, that's what we did. Nice, nice. And uh, so, what does completing the game mean uh, for NetHack? Is it kind of finding your way through a world, um, you know, and overcoming the various challenges that you mentioned, fighting with monsters and finding treasures and that kind of thing? Yeah. So it's um, it's a yeah fantasy kind of dungeon crawl game. So basically, you um, you get thrown into a dungeon with rooms and corridors connecting these rooms. You have to explore uh, in there because the environment itself is partially observable. You only see kind of what's in the current room, the moment you go out, right? There can be things happening in there that you don't see. And that itself is challenging for RL already. It's stochastic. So in the moment you attack uh, a monster, there's a die roll in the back, um, like in Dungeons and Dragons, right? And your outcomes of your actions are uncertain. That's again, a really major challenge uh, for like a current state of the art RL approaches. But yeah, yeah, as a player, you would basically uh, try to fight your way uh, down, right? So there's staircases mm -hmm. down, you get to the next level, next level. There are over 50 uh, procedurally generated levels that become more and more difficult. At the bottom of that um, uh, dungeon, that is uh, 
without hopefully spoiling too many people, is an amulet that you need to retrieve and then you need to make your entire way up again. Okay. And then there's five more really challenging uh, elemental planes. Um, and then at the end of it, you need to offer the amulet to uh, a in-game deity and then you ascend to demigodhood and you have won the game. It's Got extremely it. challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, was it a game that you played before you started doing the research in this area? Um, I did, yeah. So I, I did play a much simpler kind of clone of it that you can play uh, easily on the smartphone, which is called Pixel Dungeon, which I enjoyed okay. a lot. Um, but then uh, it was at a time actually when I was commuting between Oxford and London. So that's kind of a two-hour commute door-to-door -door where you take a train. And on that train, at least in the evenings after a full day of work, uh, yeah, I did then start to play NetHack. Um, <laughs> Specifically, when we started to get serious about this project, mm -hmm. uh, it took me two years to win in this game for the first time. Wow. Um, so it's, it's, it is really, really challenging, um, but also very funny. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, when you talk about it being procedurally generated, how many parameters are, you know, do you have uh, control over when you're generating a game? Is it, you know, you give it a seed and that kind of uh creates everything or do you have more fine-grained control over you know number of levels or difficulty or other things um so yeah basically if you just take nethack as it is you, you just define a seat and then the dungeon is created it's very subtle actually it's it's very tricky in the sense that actually there's a random number generator in the background obviously that is only advanced when you do an action that would uh, lead to a stochastic outcome. So depending on the kind of, even if you set the same seat in the beginning, depending on the kind of interactions you have on the first level, the moment you go down to the next level and depending on how far that random number generator has been already advanced, the next level is going to look differently. So one thing you can't do, even by fixing the seat, you won't get the entire dungeon the same way. You just get the first level the same way. Got and that it. is even true for like contents in kind of containers like, uh, you know, boxes. So it's, it's a bit like basically that disqualifies many of the, uh, you know, approaches that have been um, proposed that would, uh, you know, make use of the fact that the simulator is deterministic. Even if we try to make NetHack deterministic, it's a bit challenging. Uh, and so in publishing the, the, the environment and the challenge, do you, um, have you also attempted to solve it and what have you learned? What do you run into when you set RL agents loose in this kind of environment? When we released, uh, the, the NetHack learning environment last year and presented it at NURBS, we have, uh, in that paper results of a distributed deep, um, reinforcement learning approach, a pretty much kind of vanilla, um, model. And, um, we originally thought that this won't work at all, basically. It's way too hard even for um, such a kind of state-of-the-art approach to learn any meaningful behavior. We were actually surprised that our agents do learn some sensible behavior. I mean, they, they're not really getting very far in that game. They're not anywhere close to winning that game. But they learn like certain things like, you know, exploring the dungeons, um, even looking for secret doors, which can be quite tricky, kicking in locked doors, which I found a very interesting behavior because it's a pretty difficult thing to explore. Like when you're actually kicking and you're kicking against walls, you take damage and you might die. So um, it's interesting to see that over time, if you give it enough kind of interactions with the environment, it learns actually these kind of basic um, behaviors and skills. It learns to go deeper and deeper into the dungeon. Um, it alerts, learns to avoid certain very powerful um, uh, monsters. Um, it learns to um, eat, which is very important in, in the game to actually not starve uh, to death. Um, but, you know, they get to like, you know, average dungeon level five or six, some lucky agents get to dungeon level 10 or 15 even. We saw that too, but that's all like very basic, um, basic behavior. It's not on, on the level of like a human, when they start learning to play NetHack and they've never played it before, if they play for a week and they get to the same kind of level of, uh, of skills, I think they're, they're quite good. But then, you know, afterwards humans just are much, much better at kind of like this over time. And, and is there a, a score associated with the game or what is the, like the fundamental driving signal that you're giving your agents to, to, to give it success, some kind of success notion? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, there is an in-game score. Um, that score captures things like, um, you know, how deep did you go down in the dungeon? How many monsters did you kill? 
And it's a really terrible metric to try to optimize for in terms of actually yeah. winning the game. Yeah. And we, but that's basically what we did, right? We, we, we started simple and say, okay, let's use any kind of metric that we can think of. We tried the score and what happens is basically what you expect. Like if you get reward for going down a dungeon level and killing stuff, you get an agent that just, you know, goes completely berserk, tries to kill everything in their path more or less, and just tries to run down the dungeon level as quickly as possible without caring about actually, you know, finding items, equipping them in order to get stronger in the long run. So it's a very tricky challenge, right? How do we, what's even the right reward function so that yeah. we can guide an agent towards winning the game? And to be very honest, I think humans don't care about score when they learn to play this game. They don't even care about winning because it takes them hundreds or maybe even thousands of mm. games before they win for the first time. For humans, something different happens, right? They get just excited about exploring and they are intrinsically motivated to learn about how this game works and what kind of funny things you can do with it. So that's, mm -hmm. an, I think, an interesting um interesting angle to it we have to i guess you know find ways to intrinsically motivate these kind of agents to explore yeah and so that uh, that sounds a lot like curiosity and and leads to ideas about kind of the explore exploit knob is that something that um you know what do you see when you kind of play with a knob like that with a, an agent in this environment yeah so we um we provided another baseline in that in that NURPS paper which is indeed like such an intrinsic reward mechanism uh, it's called random network distillation it's a very robust um, method um, and it does give you small gains um, and significant but small gains i think we have to more long term i think we have to think about more fundamentally different ways of encouraging agents to explore things that are not directly based for example on counting that's really doesn't work here right because every game looks different so you can't really count the observations because most of them you only see once um, you um, could try to um, come up with intrinsic motivations derived from how much um, you can predict the future, but even that is really difficult in a stochastic environment that's procedurally generated where you go around a corner and you, you can't really know what's going to be around the corner or in the next dungeon level because it hasn't been generated yet. Um, I think ultimately where we had to get to, and now this is, I kind of guess, full circle to what I've been doing my PhD on like a few years ago, is actually encouraging agents to expand their knowledge about the environment dynamics, right? You as a human, you basically become a scientist within this environment. You want to understand, okay, if I take this potion and put it together with that potion, what happens, right? Um, or if I'm, if I'm, uh, you know, if I find this wand um, of digging, can I, you know, maybe dig downwards and fall just through the dungeon levels and things like that, right? Getting almost like a causal understanding of, of what's going on in this environment. So ideally, I think we at some point have agents that just reward themselves by discovering something new about the environment dynamics, not so much about actually what happens in a specific episode. Mm -hmm. And going back to uh, what you worked on in your PhD is the implication that you think that some kind of knowledge graph is the way you might represent uh, what the agent is learning? Yeah, I think, I mean, we're not like working on that explicitly right now, but um, one of the things that are, I think exciting is the environment itself is, is symbolic. So you don't actually observe the pixel. You don't have observe pixels. I mean, you can do that, but mm -hmm. you don't have to, right? You can actually just take the characters that are on the screen, the ASCII characters, and try to represent each symbol, right, using a vector. And then you could um, you could basically build relatively structured models, neurosymbolic models for that. Um, we haven't done that, but but that that is an option. Another thing that's interesting about that direction is the fact that there's also um, uh, what's called the NetHack Wiki. This is a basically a 3,000 document uh, domain-specific Wikipedia for the game of NetHack, where mm. humans over decades have been basically collecting all kinds of advice. And it's very interesting because it's not like a step-by-step -step walkthrough that you would normally you know, see in, 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 in some of the kind of video games that people play, right? It's not like a step-by-step -step that tells you, okay, here you have to go left, here you have to collect that item to then be able to do this or that. It can't be, right? Because because the game is procedurally generated, it can only be very high-level strategic advice. Uh, so mm -hmm. how to utilize that for kind of, you know, imbuing agents with a lot of prior knowledge uh, in terms of how to explore or what to do in certain situations, I think is a very interesting direction, partly also because that NetHack Wiki itself has lots of structure. So lots of kind of, you know, names and entities that are linked to each other that you could yeah. use in some way. And yeah. have there been attempts to do that? Um, not that I know of. So we... Um, 
we have this approach that we really like sharing these kind of environments and, and the baselines and our research uh, publicly and openly. So we've open sourced all of that. People are invited to to compete on that on that environment. We've even for this year organized a, a NeurIPS uh, NatHack challenge um, where we got a sponsorship uh, from Facebook I Research and, uh, and DeepMind as well, where we invited both deep uh, reinforcement learning researchers as well as actually bot makers. So people who try to handcraft uh, solutions for this uh, for this uh, environment. And we really want to see what people come up with. Obviously, we have our own kind of research directions as well, but often we use NetHack more for kind of inspiring, um, uh, you know, problems that we want to work on rather than trying to say, okay, we're going to do anything we can do just to beat that game, right? We're going to use, you know, hundreds uh, or hundreds of thousands of GPUs to just like try to look for our way. We really see it more as a generator for kind of problems that are interesting for reinforcement learning research. Mm -hmm. And we we started this conversation talking about um, trying to provide an alternative platform for RL research that was less compute intensive than some of the uh, the previous things. But it sounds like it still can be computationally intense to you know, set an agent up to navigate this environment. Uh, can you characterize the, you know, is it, you know, hundreds or thousands of GPUs required or GPU hours or like what's typically required to, um, to train an agent for this environment? Yeah. So the environment itself is not the bottleneck. So we can, um, if, if you have an extremely fast model, you could run this environment for tens of thousands of steps per second with a relatively basic uh, deep neural network uh, agent, um, we get to something like 14,000 steps a second with the models that we released uh, for NURBS. We now have um, versions of that that run roughly 20,000 steps a second, 30,000 steps a second. So basically it means with a relatively basic um, you know, deep RL agent, you can train in this environment for something like one to three billion steps a day. That's a lot of interactions. That's basically more interactions than 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 humans had with this game, uh, mm -hmm. humankind had with this game per day almost. Um, so the, the environment is really not the bottleneck. But once you start creating, you know, bigger and bigger, um, you know, deep learning models, then at some point those become basically the bottleneck. So you basically you then just have to live with the fact that your model itself might require, let's say, eight GPUs, right? And then if you want to um, if you want to um, do a hyperparameter sweep or uh, you have multiple, um, you know, ablations that you want to run, then you find yourself, yeah. well, n times that, right? But for a researcher, right. I mean, you can, I think you can do really exciting research with that environment with just one GPU. That was the plan from the, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You mentioned that the goal of the project isn't so much for your team to solve it, but to inspire other research directions or advances. What are some examples of those? Um, so, well, one example we already mentioned, right? This is, um, uh, you know, how do we imbue agents with intrinsic motivation to learn to explore in such an environment in a somewhat open-ended way, right? I mean, there's so many things to explore. There's so many, as I mentioned, hundreds of items and entities to learn to interact with. Um, another direction is uh, learning from demonstrations. So humans have been playing this game for a long time, for like three decades. And um, as of, I think, two decades ago, there are kind of online web pages where you can play the game by SSHing into a server. And you can actually record your game. Because it's so incredibly hard to play that game, basically people were interested in getting proof that they actually won this game with fair means, right? So uh, that's part of, of that story. <laughs> And actually means there are 5 million online recorded games that uh, everyone can have access to. They are hosted on art.org. And um, an open question is how can we learn from these kind of human demonstrations? It's very tricky because these human demonstrations don't record the actions. So usually in learning from demonstrations, we see the states and actions. Um, and then we can do things like behavioral cloning. So directly trying to you know just mimic basically human policies using supervised learning techniques. Here you can't do that because you only see the the observations, not the actions. But that's, again, very interesting, right? It, it kind of exemplifies a real-world problem, namely you observing a third person doing something, um, and you, we humans, we can still kind of infer from that how we should maybe act, right? Whereas for AI agents, that can be relatively tricky. So that's another direction. Um, yet uh, another direction is um, how um, can we um, 
potentially um, try to step back out of a specific episode and put the agent into a situation where it can experiment with the environment, right? Where I give it, you know, think of like something like a holodeck where, you know, the agent can experiment. Uh, we, you know, can put certain objects or certain things into that kind of contained, uh, you know, simple uh, uh, space. But the agent over time learns to pose itself more and more challenging situations and then ultimately might be able to transfer its knowledge about the environment dynamics over to, uh, the, to the full game, the actual task. Uh, curriculum learning type of yeah. direction? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and so NetHack, uh, th this project uh, ultimately led to uh, another project called MiniHack. Uh, what's that about? Yeah. Um, so MiniHack is going in the direction that I, that I just mentioned. The problem uh -huh. with NetHack is you can basically put out a really challenging environment and people can start to experiment with it. But the problem becomes that in research, what we often like to do is right, we like to actually have a specific research question that we want to uh, tackle, which might isolate a specific problem um, uh, of an RL agent, right? In that hack, you have multiple problems all appearing at the same time. We have touched upon them quite a bit already. Mm -hmm. What if you now say, okay, really, I want to, well, I want to do research on this, but I want to start simple, right? I want to have maybe only kind of a few things, like I don't want to have any monsters, I don't want to have any items, I just want to navigate mazes, for example, right? Yeah. Um, so that that's a common common I guess pattern in in AI research. We start really simple, get to a proof of concept result, then we start to crank up uh, you know complexity, right? So how do we smoothly uh, move on this kind of spectrum of nag super complex and and difficult, or like let's say really simple kind of grid world where we have full control over what's going on, right? And that led to to mini hack. Mini hack is basically. Um, leveraging NetHack to create a sandbox in which uh, you can very easily create um, problems of varying uh, difficulty um, by tapping into the richness of NetHack. Um, the way this works is that NetHack itself has um, so-called description files. So to procedurally generate it, the game, um, they are basically there's a specific language that people can use to, um, you know, create. Um, you know, random rooms and random corridors connecting these rooms. They can even, with certain probabilities, specify that certain items or monsters um, appear somewhere. They can sample even, you know, entities from a distribution of uh, of of monsters or our items. Um, they can even draw in ASCII like a level. You can actually sit down and basically type a maze, and then you can kind of compile it into NetHack, and you get an actual kind of maze to, to traverse. So this kind of domain specific language is what, what enabled Minihack. So it's basically a way to create, um, create lots and lots of interesting reinforcement learning environments that are more contained, but also very easy to extend using that domain specific language. Got it's it. a whole so kind of I, environment zoo basically. So when I asked earlier, how, much, how many degrees of freedom do you have when you're spawning one of these procedurally generated environments? In NetHack, you have your seed, but here you basically have uh, an unlimited number of possibilities yep. for creating the, the environments. Yep. Um, you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe, maybe stepping back more broadly, the, you know, we talked about curriculum learning earlier. Um, you know, the, the suggestion with NetHack is, you know, maybe you want to train agents to, I guess, similar to, to curriculum learning to focus on particular areas and maybe see if those skills generalize other ways. Uh, what's the, you know, kind of current state or thinking or frontier of curriculum learning and transfer learning uh, in the realm of RL? I guess we have, I mean, there's some work that, that, that we are focusing on, but I think more generally, I guess there's a, there's just a question around even what kind of generalization we want to see, right? Do we assume we have, you know, a fixed number of tasks and we have to, you know, we can sample problems for each of these tasks and we learn over time basically to identify when we are on an episode, which kind of task we're in and then do well. Um, the same agent, you know, do we, is the goal for the same agent to play uh, Breakout and Montezuma's Revenge and NetHack? 
You know, right. those are the tasks we're talking about, for example. Yeah, that, that could be that could be the task, right? You yeah. might have all the f- over 50 games in, in, in Atari and you might say clearly there's something to be transferred from learning how to play one game over to learning mm-hmm. to play a different game. And maybe you want to figure out in which kind of uh, order you should be presenting these kind of games to a learning agent. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, there's, there's it's it's really tricky, right? Like how do we... How do we test for the kind of generalization that we want to test? Um, what are the kind of assumptions that we bake into the kind of curriculum method that we that we that we're developing? Um, in our case, um, we started off with the assumption that there's actually a seed uh, that generates um, um, the same kind of world every time we you know use that seed. I already mentioned in NetHack itself that's already not possible, but in somewhat more simplified um, uh, environments, for example, OpenAI. ProcGen's um, benchmark with these 16 different procedurally generated games. For each of these games, you can specify a seed and then you're going to have the same kind of, let's say, maze or the same kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, jump and run kind of uh, level. And what we then were interested in is can we learn, because if you sample from these uh, seeds, right, you will sometimes get really easy levels, things where, you know, the agent has to just step left and has already won, right? Um, or finish the, the the level, and then there are really really challenging levels uh, that you could you know happen to sample, and then there's everything in between, right? So the normal approach in RL is to just uniformly sample from these kind of uh, levels, right? Or you could also call them tasks. Actually, it doesn't really matter at this point. So that's the normal approach. Um, what we were interested in is can we learn how to um, how to sample. Uh, these kind of levels in a way that we start with the easier ones so that the agent can start to learn certain skills and then gradually move over to more and more challenging uh, levels. And this is um, this is interesting because you basically always want to be at the frontier of the, what the agent can currently do. Right? You don't want to present uh, levels that are too easy and not uh, levels that are too hard. You always want to be somewhere where the agent isn't really sure whether it's going to do well or not. And we actually exploit exactly that uh, property so in um, many current RL agents, we, um, um, we are using what's called a value function um, to stabilize training. So basically, the agent at every step tries to predict how well it's going to do in the remainder of the episode. And actually, it turns out we can use that value function to uh, estimate a value error. So basically, that's a discrepancy between what the agent thought how well it's going to do and then how well it actually did. And now if you think about it, right, there are four kind of uh, setups. There's you think you're doing really poorly and you'll do really poorly. So that's not interesting because you basically just realize you're in a really tough situation. You think you're going to do really well and you're actually doing really well. Again, that's not very interesting because that's way too easy. But well, the other two are interesting. So you think you're going to do really well and you did really poorly, or you think you're going to do really poorly and you actually did really well. So these are the kind of uh, levels or configurations that help you if you were to replay the level in the future again and try to learn from it, that actually helps you to actually learn something. And this is um, this approach um, is called prior test level replay. We it has level in the name, but actually it's more general in that any kind of environment where you have a configuration that you can reset to, you can apply that approach. So if you think about, for example, a robot simulator where you have certain blocks that need to be stacked and the blocks are arranged in front of the robot, right? Um, that kind of arrangement is a configuration. You could specify that via a seed and you could apply that approach. It's so analogous to an active learning kind of scenario yeah. where you're trying to provide some signal into the training process for uh, where you have the opportunity to gain most new information. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, and going further now, um, this is a paper that, that we just got accepted at NeurIPS. We can actually turn that into a approach for what's called unsupervised environment design. So mm. in unsupervised environment design, you basically separate your agent into kind of two agents, one that's the student that learns basically to do an episode and the, it's basically the agent you at the end of the day care about because that's the agent you're going to use to then test whether it's any good. Mm-hmm. And another agent, a teacher agent, and that teacher agent is basically trying to generate uh, problems. It's gi- generating actual you know levels or environments. Mm-hmm. And uh, it turns out if you actually not really treat that as an agent, but you just randomly sample from your procedurally generated kind of environment design space, if you just randomly sample seeds um, and you um, you rank them or you basically filter them by the learning potential for the current student's policy, then over time, the levels that you keep, the levels that you actually use for training the student, they will gradually become more difficult and more difficult and more difficult. And basically through that kind of 
complexity increase, you see very interesting problems um, uh, you know, emerging through, through that process, as well as you see a student that's actually very strong at, at the end of the day, generalizing to held out handcrafted um, uh, problems. So what mm -hmm. we call it, we call that usually zero shot generalization. So okay. taking, taking that agent into a completely new situation, see how it does. And can you, or how can you predict the uh, learning potential for a given seed before the agent has attempted the seed? I, uh, when we talked about it previously, yeah. it was the difference between their results, uh, their expected outcome and their actual outcome. Yeah. So you can't, so you have to play it right. once yeah. and then okay. when you done it once, you basically have a score for that kind of level in terms of the learning potential for presenting it again in the future. And you keep that in the buffer. And now basically at every time step, the student agent um, either samples basically completely new level, right? From uh, just your seat or it samples one of the levels from the buffer and uses, uses that to train. Okay. No. Uh, and then ultimately you're trying to drive with this uh, adversarial approach, like greater training efficiency and converging on successful agents more quickly. Yeah. And um, what kind of results have you seen uh, in applying the technique? So the, the things that we did was we started again, very simple, right? I mean, again, I mentioned this kind of spectrum of, okay, yeah. you can say here's a super complex environment. And here are like more kind of toyish grid worlds. We started mm -hmm. with the grid worlds um, and we um, trained agents to basically generate mazes and then student agents to navigate these mazes. That mm -hmm. itself is not a super interesting problem because you could just code up uh, a symbolic uh, agent that is really good at traversing mazes. But it mm -hmm. presents an interesting challenge for reinforcement learning because you only get reward when you finish the maze, right? And depending on how big your maze becomes, this is very, very tricky. Um, so now we have this kind of process, you know, that's um, generating the teacher generating or curating, basically, that's how we call it, curating levels for mm -hmm. students to learn. And then you actually see over time, the kind of uh, levels that are kept to train the student agent, they become quite complex. They have a quite interesting uh, structure that resembles to some extent actual mazes. So now the student learns in that, and then we take it out of that kind of, um, space and actually presented with handcrafted quite tricky mazes and we see how well the student does in these and actually we do see quite quite strong zero shot generalization to these kind of held out problems so just to be very clear this is really kind of out of domain generalization in that these kind of handcrafted levels were not within the distribution of the levels that uh, you would normally see during training right so that's that's a kind of interesting bit and mm -hmm. then we thought okay if that works for mazes maybe we can also do this in a continuous control environment so we actually moved over to 2D car racing and we um, let the teacher to basically over time generate um, Formula One tracks. I mean, not actual Formula One tracks, but yeah. basically race tracks. And we have this student kind of trying to get through these as quickly as possible. And then we again have held out handcrafted race tracks, namely actual Formula One tracks, and see how well the student can generalize to these kind of unseen tracks. So mm -hmm. in both cases, we see uh, a strong generalization performance. Got it. Got it. And when you say the, the, uh, handcrafted maps are out of distribution, how far out of distribution or are they out of distribution in any particular ways? Are they, uh, more complex? Are they, do they have different features? Uh, yeah. So they have more blocks. They have more structure, um, in the kind of, you know, levels you get by just randomly sampling basically blocks on a, on a, on a map, right? You you're not necessarily getting a lot of really complicated structure, but we have like mazes where you have a labyrinth, for example, or you have mazes where you have lots of different kind of corridors and you have to basically check each of them and you have to backtrack, right? You have to memorize where you already mm -hmm. been. Um, and, and these were the kind of held out, uh, mazes. I don't have a quantification of how much out of yeah. distribution they are, but basically on, you look at the paper and you, you eyeball basically, okay, here are the <laughs> randomly generated ones. Here are the handcrafted ones. You'll see a very notable difference. Got it. Got it. Uh, and then, uh, what, what's next? What, 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 uh, research directions, you know, we've talked about, uh, several potential directions. Uh, what are you most excited about, uh, in terms of building on this foundation? So one of the things I'm very excited about is this, this space of unsupervised environment design. I think we as a field only started to scratch the surface of that. Um, in an, you know, ideal world in the next kind of few years, we have, I think very interesting AI systems that really can create very complex, rich, um, uh, you know, interesting uh, 
uh, you know, whole worlds, right? I mean, not just like 2D mazes, but, you know, imagine kind of, uh, you know, 3D um, Minecraft environments, right? And we had then have also students, uh, student agents that learn to do very interesting, complex stuff in these environments. I think that would be something that would be very exciting, but I think it requires a lot of um, additional work in that uh, you need to basically, I think, over time compound complexity, right? If you were to design a level for me, I don't think you would just randomly or like just with one kind of stroke sketch one, right? You would actually start somewhere and then develop it slowly over time. You would test it out, right? See what actually a student now does in the level. And then depending on whether it does really well or poorly, you'd start to, I guess, refine it a bit. So I think there's lots of stuff to be to be done in that space. And there's some one of the things I'm very excited about. Um, the other thing I'm excited about is, I guess, more ways to intrinsically motivate agents as we discussed earlier, right? How we how do we make sure agents just get excited about expanding their knowledge about certain dynamics in the environment? Um, really some kind of open-ended process that just uh, you know allows the agent to explore all kinds of things in the environment, becoming basically a scientist within such a simulated environment. That's something that's, that's also very exciting to me. Um, and then I think also just looking more for, yeah, applications in, in, in other uh, domains and environments. I think one of the things that we really want to I guess, be able to do is develop methods that are of somewhat general nature, right? That's why we cared about, okay, we start in the grid world with discrete actions, but does it also work in a continuous control environment, right? So this is, I think, very, very important. Likewise, I think it's very important for us as a field to be very explicit about the kind of simplifying assumptions that are baked into some of the environments that we use for research. And I think mapping that out in a bit more structured way would be very useful as well. Awesome. awesome. Also, sorry, just on the environment design <laughs> aspect, I mean, we talked about how that's useful to train like student agents that then generalize. I think there's also something interesting maybe going forward where we also make sure that these kind of levels might be interesting to a human, right? I'm not really sure how do we quantify that, but that mm. could be a, a nice side effect, right? How do, how do we create more and more engaging content for for human players in, in some of these kind of environments? Right, right. Awesome, awesome. Well, Tim, thanks so much for joining us and sharing a bit about what you're working on. Yeah, thanks so much. It, really, it was a really exciting discussion. Thanks. Thank you.